reason for you tonight. The tale of two cities. As you're going to look, young people, in the course of this next 12, or this 12 months before you, you're going to look at this man, Daniel, and you're going to see that it's all about, it's all about, is this a pen? Ah, good. It's all about, no, it just ran out. It's not about shoes. Ah, oh, no, that's no good. Now, I actually have, I've bought, just in case this happened, I have bought a blue pen, so this is good. All about choices. You're going to see that Daniel, whether it's chapter 1, chapter 2, right through to chapter 12, it's going to be all about choices in life. And that's why your theme, the tale of two kingdoms. So when you have to make a choice, young people, when you're faced with making a decision where there's more than one possibility, when making that decision, when making that choice, I'm going to say this right at the start, you have to have, you have to have the right outlook, you have to have the right mindset, you have to have the right information, you have to have the right ability and you have to have clarity to make the correct decision for your future that is not swayed, that is not influenced by present circumstances or current conditions that could be occurring at the moment. Darcy, can you just repeat that sentence? <laughs> oh, I hate picking on Darcy, he's so good. But that was a big mouthful. So what I want to do, I, want, I just want to make, I just want to it, it, just show how important this is, okay? So when you make a choice, when you make a choice, when you make a decision, you must not be swayed or influenced or moved by what is happening at the moment, the current conditions that are occurring in the moment. That's why, young people, we're going to see that Daniel absolutely shines in decision-making techniques. And standing right alongside this young teenager, Daniel, supporting him, encouraging him, inspiring him, there were three friends of faith. And they were all together teenagers in training. And for you guys too this year, all of you, all of you together, you all are teenagers in training. And in subsequent classes, God willing for you all, you're going to walk alongside of these four friends and you're going to witness their faith demonstrated in front of some of the most challenging, some of the most fierce, some of the most testing moments that you could ever imagine. I want you to think about some of these young people as we think about just some of these things that these teenagers had to face. These four young men stood and looked directly into the eyes of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the king of the world. He's a man whose anger and whose fury knows no bounds at all. He's a king who could just flick his fingers and snuff your life out instantly. There's no second chance with this guy, Nebuchadnezzar. You got on the wrong side of this man and he'll squash you like a mosquito. Gone. And you know what, young people? Try to snuff him out, he does. And you're going to get to chapter 3 and you're going to witness where it's recorded that the three friends stood tall in front of intense heat, in front of flames, in front of a fire, young people, in front of a furnace that had been heated with more wood and more wood and more wood and more wood, seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. And these three boys, these three teenagers stepped right in and they faced the flames with faith. And you're going to see, young people, that, and this is an interesting thought, God didn't deliver them from that intense trial. But he sure did deliver them out of it. You think about that in your life. God did not deliver them from that intense trial. They walked straight into that fire. But God sure delivered them out. And you know, you're going to continue on this year, God willing, and, and you're going to get to Daniel chapter 5, where Daniel, he's fast asleep. He's woken out of sleep and he's rushed into a palace party. And Belshazzar there, he's shaking like a leaf. And Daniel stands before this king and he confidently and courageously looks at the writing on the wall and he looks at Belshazzar and he says, It is finished. 
And then you get to that moment in Daniel chapter 6 where Daniel, he's going to pray. He's going to pray as he's ever prayed before with the window wide open. And nothing is going to flinch the thought, young people, of being flung into a den of lions with these starved, ravenous, bone-crunching lions. And Daniel still knelt and he still prayed with the window wide open. So how did these teenagers find the strength? How did they find the belief? How did they find the confidence? How did they find the conviction not to submit, not to give in, not to capitulate, not to surrender? Because young people, when they made a decision, when they made a choice, they made that choice when they weren't swayed by what was happening in the present moment. They made a deliberate, determined choice to follow their God. So, young people, two kingdoms, the tale of two kingdoms. And that decision, that choice was between God's kingdom and man's kingdom. And the choice comes down to two facts, young people, when you have those two kingdoms. comes down to two facts. It's the here and now, or it's the there and then. It's living for the moment now, that's one choice, living for the moment now and all that this moment could give you. Or it's living for eternity and beyond. And all those experiences that are going to never, ever, ever end. It's so simple. The choice is so straightforward. The choice, young people, it's uncomplicated. It was the choice in Daniel's day It was the choice that every single Bible character had to make in this book, in their day. And it's the choice in your day. And that choice between the two kingdoms is made right now, today. The choice for your endless future. Choose your eternity. We're going to finish off, I think, we're going to finish off with that song. We're going to sing that song, young people, that it's just going to lift this roof. Choose your eternity. Now, there's one word, one word, young people, that I want you to take out of tonight's talk. If you forget everything else, that's cool, that's fine, that's okay. But you've got to remember this one word that I'm going to tell you tonight. One word that's found in our reading, which Stephen read for us, that's going to help you in the choice between... The two kingdoms. And you, wanna, you need to highlight this, um, this word in Daniel chapter 1. Okay, we're going to play a little bit of Haman Hangman right now. This one word, young people, it's found in this chapter. It's one word that becomes the foundation, the rock, the certainty for Daniel and for his three friends that influenced them and, in, in, and, and included his, all, his, his three friends with them. Have you got any thoughts about what this one word is? Because I want you to really understand this one word. And as I said, you think about this one word, when, when tonight's all over, when supper's finished, when the lights are flicked off and when the car park is empty and when you're all heading off home, This is the one word I want you to take out of our talk tonight. Okie dokie, Jonah, give me a letter. Dum, dum, dum. Let's not choose Jonah. Let's choose Darcy. Ah, Darcy can spell. Okay, Zaccarelli. I like that. P for... Sorry, guys. Zach's just mucked it all up. Okay, but it's good. It's good that he was on the right page. This, young people, and the verse. What verse is it in? Verse 8. Get your colour pencils out and colour in the word purposed. Colour in that word purpose in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Because this one word changed completely the direction of Daniel's life, and it can change your life too, young person. Purposed. Let's have a look at what it says there in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But, 
Oh, I love it when it's got that little word but to start a sentence. Whatever is said before is fine, but there's a change. Daniel purposed in his heart. And from the opening chapter of Daniel chapter 1, right through to Daniel chapter 12, we're going to see that this young teenager had a clearly defined purpose-driven, purpose-influenced life. And that word purpose means to, have a, to be resolute, to be immovable, to be unchangeable, to be unshakable, to have a clear direction and a clear purpose in life. You know, young people, you'd be able to place before Daniel, you could place before him a selection of the best food in the land. You can pour into his cup some of the most, most high quality wine. You could clothe him in the best linen fabric. You can have someone who is the most intellectual professor yakking in his ear. You can elevate him to the highest position in government. It never changed his outlook. It never changed his choice. It never changed his purpose in life. So, young person, what's your purpose in life? Have, have you a purpose in life? Are you so convinced and, and so convicted with your choice? Or are you just wandering and drifting through life? You know, that might be how you feel right now. You might feel like you're just drifting through life, drifting, just going through the motions, just, just going with the flow. And, and that's okay. But moving forward from tonight, this word purposed could help you like it helped Daniel. And it can give you certainty and clarity and determination and direction in the choice that you make. And he purposed, young people, he purposed in his heart. It was a conviction that took over his complete body and thought and motive and action. You know what, young person? God has a purpose with you, with every single one of you. We're going to go to this quote a bit later tonight, but you're going to write it in verse 8. Just underline that word purposed in your margin and write this quote next to it, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, We know, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and that are called according to God's purpose. Jot that down, Romans 8, verse 28. So young people, just like Daniel, you have been called according to God's purpose. But you never know, young person, what your influence or your purpose-driven life has on the person that's sitting right next to you tonight. Your purpose-driven life can have an effect upon that person sitting right alongside you. Because we certainly know that Daniel influenced his three friends because he had a purpose in life. And you might notice, as we, as we highlighted on that screen, that right up to verse 8, this is all about Daniel. He purposes in his heart and then his three friends come on board. They all, your, you, ye, thy, they're all in this together. Daniel influenced his friends. And you know, young people, all heroes of the Bible have a purpose and they know their purpose. And they pursued their purpose in life. None more so, of course, than our Lord Jesus Christ. You think about his purpose when Luke records these words. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it said, When the time was come that the Lord Jesus was going to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew the purpose and he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So young people, the choices we have, God's kingdom or man's kingdom. That's the purpose, that's the choice that you need to make in your heart, in your life. But what makes that choice between God's kingdom and man's kingdom. What makes it at times so difficult? You know, if you ask someone who's facing the reality of death, someone who knows that they only have a short time left to live, perhaps because they have an illness or a disease, and, and the doctors give them, say, say, two months. If you go and ask that somebody, 
who is in that sad situation about the choice of life, God's kingdom or man's kingdom, they won't even pause or hesitate with their response to you. Their choice is without doubt a desire to be in God's kingdom, a future eternity in a world of peace and joy and happiness, no longer suffering and sickness and sadness. And their choice, young people, without a doubt, they would stay straight away to you. The kingdom of God, because for them it's so real, the need is so great, and oh, the passion is so full of emotion, they want God's kingdom to come. The choice for them is so clear. But if you are somebody who supposedly has a lifetime stretched out before them, the prospect of a life rolling on and on and on, with possibly great possessions along the way, perhaps building up a great portfolio with many opportunities, sometimes, not always, but sometimes that answer to the choice, to the reply, God's kingdom or man's kingdom is not so instant. It's not so definite. It's not so conclusive. Why? Well, it's because, as you all would know, the here and now, has so much of a pull on all of us. And it's those things that we can see, that we can touch, that we can taste, that we can smell, that we can, that we can merge into. We can put our big toe into that lukewarm water, can't we? And sadly, before we know, we slip right in. And before we know it, we're submerged and we're swamped with all that's swirling around us in the here and now. And it's only a matter of time before we sink with the rest of your humanity in the here and now. But that's not the case when we have the choice, the clear choice of God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And we're going to find in Daniel chapter 2 that statement that you know so well that Daniel's going to say this to the king, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never, ever, ever be destroyed. And Daniel believed that. And Daniel purposed that in his heart. And he made that choice, young people, from a teenage years. That choice which is going to see him stand again on the earth. And you know what? If you make that right choice today, you too can stand right alongside of Daniel in that kingdom of God. So what a journey your classes are going to take you forward in this coming year. As you walk in the footsteps and as you follow this purpose-driven teenager. So the story begins, as Steve read for us tonight, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. When Daniel, he was about, does anyone know how old possibly Daniel was? Darcy? D for Darcy, D for Daniel, D for smart. <laughs> That's really awkward. I hope they're not taping this. Uh, he's around about 16 to 18 years old. So you won't want to put a little note in your margin. Daniel's just 16 to 18 years old. And on that day, young people, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, the dreaded moment on that day when Daniel's life was never, ever, ever going to be the same again. The day when his life and his circumstances turned completely upside down. Because Nebuchadnezzar and his men had arrived in the neighbourhood of Jerusalem. But before we look at this Babylonian army that had advanced down. I just want to give a little bit of background to the times in Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. Daniel had been born in the period of one of the greatest reforms, one of the greatest revivals in the nation of Judah. And that was established by King Josiah and alongside of him the prophet Jeremiah. Both of these, the king and the prophet, were raised and named by Yahweh. And they were to guide and direct the nation and to pull them out of their apathy, out of their idolatry, out of their false worship and turn the nation back to God. You see, Josiah's birth had been prophesied way back in the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam, 350 years earlier. Abijah the, the prophet had said, there's going to come a king called Josiah. A righteous king was going to come. And I can just imagine, young people, Daniel's parents, Daniel's mum and dad, as, as they saw that prophecy 350 years later coming to pass in their days, fulfilled in their lifetime. And Daniel's mum and dad would have witnessed the amazing reform that happened all around them that Josiah the king instigated. 
And no doubt the meal times around their table would have been active and excitedly talking about how Josiah was at last changing the heart of the nation back to Yahweh. And young Daniel was sitting there at that table and he was soaking it all in. Josiah was only eight years old when he began his reign. And he reigned for 31 years. And it's recorded that he did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh. And he walked in the ways of David his father. And he declined neither to the right or to the left. He never declined. He went straight forward. That is said of no other king. This King Josiah. So he set about to cleanse the land of, that had been filled with idolatry, with wickedness and with sin. And he, with the vigour and determination, he systematically went right through the nation of Judah, breaking down the false images, grinding them into dust. In fact, 2 Kings 23 uses these words. It says, he burnt, he put down, he broke in pieces, he stamped it to powder. He cleansed the temple, he repaired Yahweh's house, he restored the vessels of Yahweh's house and he instigated a huge national revival. He re-established the Passover and it says there that the Passover he kept, there had been no Passover kept since the days of Samuel the prophet, like to the one of King Josiah. Such was his influence for good. And the young Daniel was born right in the midst of this great revival this great spiritual revival which would have had an enormous influence on the young boy Daniel. Wow, what a time. He was born where it was right worship, right feasts, right ways. It could, life could not have been better for the young boy, for that young teenager Daniel. What a positive outlook was spreading through the nation. But suddenly and tragically, Josiah was slain in battle when Daniel was about 14 years of age. And because of this, Daniel experienced the immense sadness that the nation felt with the loss of one of its greatest kings of Judah. And a dark, dark, dark cloud covered the nation. And the nation plummeted into a period of mourning with emotion and grief being poured out that's recorded in Chronicles. And this day of mourning for the death of King Josiah, the mourning that that nation went through is actually compared to what the nation of Israel today, in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 11, the mourning of Josiah is going to be compared to the mourning that the nation of Israel is going to experience when they see the Lord Jesus Christ and recognise that he is the one whom they pierced. Such was the morning for Josiah. But it's here, young people, in Daniel's day where it hurts really greatly. Because all it took was three months after Josiah had died for Josiah's son, the newly appointed Jehoahaz, to reverse everything that Josiah had done in re-establishing work and worship for Yahweh. Three months, 90 days was all it took for Josiah's son, to flip everything that Josiah had done on its head. And it says in 2 Kings 23, Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his fathers had done. And Daniel, young people, and his family witnessed overnight the nation suddenly spiralling back into idolatry. And no doubt the talk over the meal table was now what had happened to the nation. And how that must have affected young Daniel to build into him a purpose in his heart that he would stay resolute and committed to the worship that Josiah the king had established. And he purposed in his heart to keep things going for him that way. And more upheavals. After three months, Jehoahaz was removed from being king. The next king was put on the throne, Jehoiakim. And he was no different to Jehoahaz, another tragic king. And that's where our story begins in verse 1. In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And you got already, young people, you got again this comparison. King of Judah, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Jehoiakim, 
two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. And we've already got these comparisons that you're going to see all through the book of Daniel. So we have here Babylon. Does anyone know what the name Babylon means? Darcy? Okay, can anybody help Darcy with this one? What does the word Babylon mean? Have you got a little note in your margin? Which is yours, Josh? Haven't used one. Cool. Have you got a little note in your margin? If you haven't, put this little note. It means confusion by mixing. So underline the word Babylon, get your pencil out, put in the margin, confusion by mixing. Does anybody know what Jerusalem means? Darcy. He just gave a big sigh. I'm not going to pick on him anymore. But do you know the answer, to Darcy? No. Vision or foundation of peace. So Babylon, confusion by mixing. Jerusalem, vision or foundation of peace. But in verse 1, young people of our story, that vision, that foundation of peace is about to be smashed in total confusion. And those like Daniel who were attuned to the signs of the times had heard reports from out of the north that Nebuchadnezzar had just defeated the Egyptians in one of the greatest historic battles at Carchemish. He routed the Egyptians completely and Babylon was on the move, coming southwards, heading to Jerusalem, heading straight to the city that Daniel lived. And the end of verse 1 has two words, besieged it. Imagine the terror, the horror and the dread that that statement, besieged it, conjures up. You imagine, young person, your city, your house, your family, your life, is besieged by these Babylonian boys. And what made this even more frightening, young people, is about a hundred years earlier, the prophet Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 39 verse 7, he said that this is going to happen, the Babylonians are going to come down. And you know what else he prophesied? He said, the descendants of Hezekiah are going to be taken away to Babylon. And this prophecy now is about to be fulfilled. And Daniel was a descendant of Hezekiah. Verse 3 tells us that he's of the king's seed. Wow. I can just imagine the mill conversation as the army of Babylon got closer and closer and closer to Jerusalem. And Daniel's dad and mum were looking at their teenager Daniel, worried about the future. And they were instilling into that young lad Daniel the hope of the promises of God, that come what may, God can be trusted to fulfil what he has promised. Just a little bit of a story, young people, about what the Babylonians were like. Just have a bit of a read with me what Habakkuk, how Habakkuk destri- describes the Babylonians. God's going to raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, They're going to march through the breadth of the land to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are coming to take Jerusalem. They are terrible, dreadful. Their horses are are swifter than leopards. They are more fierce than the evening wolves. They'll fly down like an eagle, hasting to eat. They are all for violence. Their faces are going to sup up as the east wind, smelling up the east wind as they roar down. They'll gather the captivity of sand. They'll scoff at whatever the king, the princes, and scorn. They'll deride every stronghold and they'll make it a heap and they shall take it. And verse 1 of Daniel chapter 1 says, The Babylonian army had now besieged their city. Imagine how Daniel felt. Surrounding their city, surrounding their home, surrounding their family, surrounding their life, snuffing out every bit of their breath was these brutal, cruel, fierce, wild Babylonians who like a storm had come down to flood the land and had encamped right around the city of Jerusalem and besieged it, says the end of verse 1. They were there for the long haul, prepared to sit it out, come what may, however long it takes, to suffocate the life out of the city. And four friends with their families three times a day, no doubt, pray to their God for a miraculous deliverance, something like Hezekiah had experienced. 
Can you imagine what it would have been like for those teenagers, young people? Their, their stomachs would have been in absolute knots. As outside their walls were those people that were as cruel as wolves and could rip them apart like an eagle tears flesh. And these four teenagers would have shuddered at the brutality, at the savagery, at the violence that was about to be unleashed upon their beloved city and upon their beloved people. And they're only your age, young people. They're teenagers, your age. And like Joseph years and years earlier, they now face the possibility of the consequences of being ripped out of their home taken away from their family and dragged far away into a strange, foreign, frightening city. And the city fell. And the life for those four friends would never be the same again. No more happiness, no more joyful worship, no more Passover feasts, no more fraternising around all the prophecies. The light in their life was momentarily extinguished. And their last view, just picture in your mind, young people, the last view of Jerusalem, as they walked away bound as captives, as they glanced over their shoulder at the city of Jerusalem, at the vision, the foundation of peace, it was fading in the distance, young people. And with every step they took, their hearts were broken. These young people, torn away from their city they loved, Torn away from the security and safety of family and friends. Torn away possibly from their parents. Torn away from their worship. Torn away from hearing the prophets. Torn away from their God. And they knew firsthand the devastation and the destruction and the effects. The heartbreak and the fear of war. And you know young people, they had to walk 3,000 kilometres they trudged through dirt and dust as they headed to a new foreign land in, uncertain, in an uncertain life of slave. But you know what? They hadn't packed. You know you get those little bags, Darcy, you have one of those little cases where you have a little handle and little wheels on it and you put all your nice little things and you wheel away off on a holiday. Under one arm you have your sleeping bag, the other arm you have your pillow. They, and you board a bus with air-conditioned comfort. These teenagers walked 3,000 kilometres. That's the distance, young people, of walking from here to Perth. Or if someone's from Sydney, just for Chairman Josh's sake, from someone from here to Sydney and all the way back. That's what these teenagers had to walk. And you could forgive them, young people. You could forgive them if that traumatic experience had a huge negative reaction and impact upon their faith and upon their belief and upon their trust in their God. You, you could forgive them because their lives from that day on was in tatters. Where was God? When they needed him, they could have thought. As with blistered feet, they continued their forced walk 3,000 kilometres all the way to Babylon. You know, young people, sometimes our response to tragedy and to trauma in our lives, we question, why me? Why has God allowed this to happen to me? Where is God when all this has happened? And I can just imagine the conversations between the captives as they, as they trudged northward. And this was like another wilderness wandering, young people. It's all over again. But this time they're not heading to the promised land. They're heading away from it. And no doubt about it, there would have been grumbling and, com, com, and, and complaining and, and, and murmuring. Their God had left them, they would have said, but not from Daniel and his three friends. Not one grumble is recorded from the four friends in this chapter right through to Daniel chapter 12. But just have a look at the next four words in our story that start verse 2. And Yahweh gave. You know, in my Bible, I've got that little statement in this commencement of verse 2 highlighted as we've got it on the screen there. And Yahweh gave. I, I never want to overlook, I never want to forget that little phrase. Because that's Daniel's words. He wrote that. He recorded that it wasn't the strength, it wasn't the might, it wasn't the power of the Babylonian armies that overthrew the city. 
No, no, no. Daniel writes that it was his God, Yahweh gave. It was his God who he trusted in. It was his God who he loved. It was his God who had faithfully worshipped, who he had prayed to for care and protection. Daniel records that his God allowed the city to be taken and allowed him to face the horrors of captivity. You know, and that wasn't all that his God allowed to happen to Daniel and his three friends. You think about this. God allowed Daniel to be taken as a captive. He allowed Daniel to be ripped away from his family life in Jerusalem, possibly never to see his family again. God allowed Daniel to become a eunuch. And the medical conditions that they suffer due to, during to that process is awful. Stunted growth, an imbalance in hormones, increased chances of depression and other medical complications when someone is made a eunuch. Not only that, young people, God allowed that situation to occur. That means he had, Daniel and his three friends had no wife. They had no children. They had no family. And it wasn't going to be just for a few years in this captivity and then return home again. Daniel's whole lifetime from that day on was to be in a foreign land for the next 70 years. And Daniel in chapter 1 verse 2 wrote, My God allowed this to happen to me. And he was only 17 years old. He's your age. And there's no bitterness, there's no frustration, there's no anger, there's no resentment. Daniel simply accepted not his will, but God's will be done. Wow, young people, that, oh, I find that astounding, that, that all his dreams were gone in a flash. How would you feel if all your dreams, your aspirations were completely wiped out? And even though his God, the God that he served, had allowed the worst possible things to happen to Daniel... This teenager still purposed in his heart that come what may in the darkest hours of his life, he would never give up on his God. God gives and God takes. Job learnt that when he was 70 years of age and Daniel learns it and he experiences it when he's 17 years. But you know what, young people? God does care. He does see, he does know, he does act, he does provide. And I want you to look at this, because even though Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1 verse 2, he acknowledges that his God gave the nation into captivity right at the start of this chapter, there's another phrase I want you to highlight towards the end of this chapter. Here it is, right here on the screen. There's another phrase, young people, where Daniel again acknowledges that God has also given in verse 17. He says, God has given them knowledge and wisdom and learning and understanding in all the situations in life. You see, young people, I'm going to highlight those two. Because God does care and he does provide in ways far beyond our understanding. But of course, at that moment, the boys didn't know that as they were marching towards Babylon. But you know what? The aged prophet, Jeremiah, whom they respected so much, you know he sent a letter when they went into, Bapt into Babylon, Jeremiah sent a letter following them to give them a little bit of perspective about what was happening. Turn back to Jeremiah chapter 24. Here's the copy of the letter that was sent by Jeremiah to these captives in Babylon. We read in verse 1 that Yahweh showed Jeremiah this amazing vision. The basket of figs was set before the temple of Yahweh after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken them captive. So this was sent into Babylon for Daniel and that to read. And in this basket, it says in verse 2, there was a basket, one had good figs and the other had very naughty figs. Not looking at you, Darcy. Very naughty figs. So rotten they couldn't be eaten. And Yahweh said in verse 3, what do you see, Jeremiah? And he says, figs, good figs, very good. Hey, very good. Do you know the first time that was mentioned? Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. These figs here were likened to creation. They were very good and the evil were very evil. 
And the word of Yahweh came unto him again, saying, verse 5, Thus saith Yahweh, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, for their good. Highlight that, young people. And in verse 6, I'll set my eyes upon them for good. You see, they were marching all the way into Babylon because God allowed it for their good, for the good of these good figs. And a little note you want to put in your margin right next to verse 5. Underline that and again, put in your margin Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things do work together for good, though at the moment, at the time, they may not seem that situation is the way. So how comforting it would have been that the captives in Babylon received this letter from Jeremiah and they read verse 6 that God is going to bring them back and verse 7 he's going to give them a heart to know their God. How comforting it would have been for those four friends to receive this prophecy. They were the good figs in a bad, bad, bad place. And they would have looked at this prophecy and they would have looked at each other with a greater resolve, with a greater purpose, with a greater conviction, with a greater determination not to submit one moment to whatever Babylon was going to try. God allowed the good fix to endure difficulties and uncertainties to develop their faith. That one that brings those four young teenagers to this absolute belief that there was nothing they could do but rely completely upon their God. And together they purposed in their hearts, come what may, they would face the Babylonian trial together. So come back now to Daniel chapter 1. And it's interesting as we read on in verse 2 that Yahweh gave, Daniel acknowledges this is the hand of Yahweh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar with part of the vessels the very vessels that Josiah had re-established in the temple, part of the vessels Nebuchadnezzar took out of that place and he carried them into the land of... Notice it doesn't say Babylon. Notice in verse 2 it says the land of Shinar. Darcy, what does Shinar mean? Mm -hmm. He's taking so many notes. It's unbelievable. Okay, so Shinar means, underline that in your margin... The enemy's tooth. You imagine that picture, young people. The snarl exposing the teeth. And what Daniel is saying by using that term, Shinar, he wants you to know that they are leaving behind a land flowing with milk and honey and they are heading right into the mouth of the snarling enemy of God. And going there too was part of Yahweh's vessels. Those vessels that had been carefully made to worship Yahweh. Why does verse 2 repeat vessels, vessels, vessels? Why does Daniel want us to know that those vessels went into captivity? Because those vessels, put a note in your margin, they represent the glory of God and his relationship with his nation. These vessels were used in worship to God. And Daniel knew that these vessels symbolised the people as individuals and their relationship that they had to God. Paul in the New Testament refers to us as vessels. And here in our story, they are taken out of God's temple and placed in Nebuchadnezzar's temple. You see, those vessels went all that way. Just like Joseph's bones went all the way with Israel as they came out of Egypt, as a reminder every day, of the promise of God. And those vessels went all the way, 3,000 kilometres, into Babylon. And the question is, would the vessels remain pure in an unholy place? Well, as we said, those vessels represent the individuals that the nation looked, the individuals in that nation. And I wonder what happened to those vessels. You know, this is amazing, but in verse 7, the name Belteshazzar. They changed his name to Belteshazzar. Do you know that that name means the keeper of the hidden treasures of Bel? Possibly Daniel oversaw the care of those vessels to ensure that they were safe and secure whilst in Babylon. And he did a great job. Because 70 years later, every vessel, according to Ezra chapter 1 verse 7, 
Every vessel was numbered and returned back. Not one vessel was lost. So the good figs, young people, the vessels of Yahweh and the captives all arrived at Babylon. All arrived at Babylon. And here's that little quote which just reminds us of the things that work together for good. The good figs that arrived there in Babylon. You see here, young people, we know that all things work together for good. They may not be good, as Daniel was experienced, but they will work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. So as they made that journey for 3,000 kilometres and they arrived there at Babylon, you imagine the sight as these young teenagers arrived to see this place. It would have blown their minds away. It would be so easy to blend into Babylonian life, to integrate into that society, to be sucked into that lifestyle with all the amazing architecture It was the greatest city on earth. Just have a look, young people, at some of these pictures here. The Ishtar Gate, with all the ornaments and the tiles and the decorative decorative artwork that was done. Herodotus said that Babylon surpassed in splendour any city of the then known world. Three million people lived in this place. And have a look at some of these facts. Some of these facts here about Babylon. They had a wall that was 90 kilometres that surrounded Babylon. This wall was 300 feet high and and 35 feet below the surface. It was 25 feet thick. And you could ride horse chariots right around the top of these walls of Babylon. You imagine as these teenagers arrived at this city on earth. And their life and the pressure was now about to increase. And it says there that in verse 3, that children, at the end of verse 3, that they will bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom there was no blemish. This was, Babylonian had chosen the cream of the teens. These were the top ones with a purpose of making them stand before the king. And notice just how there, it emphasises in this record how that these are teenagers. There's a whole group of teenagers of the king's seed that were there. And they were smart, intelligent people. It says in verse 4, these teenagers, there was no blemish. They were well favoured. They were skilled in all wisdom. They were cunning in knowledge. They understood science and they had the ability to stand before Nebuchadnezzar the king. And he wanted to train them. He wanted to manipulate them into Babylonian way of life. So he offered to each of those teenagers three years, all expenses paid, the best education life could give. Wow. Imagine if you got that letter in your letterbox. Three years, all expenses paid, food, clothes and shelter. Special treatment just for you. How easy, young people, it would have been for Daniel and his three friends just to mould into Babylonian style. It's only three years. And in verse 4 it says, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make them think like a Babylon. In verse 5 he wanted to eat like a Babylon. In verse 6 he wanted them to be called like a Babylon. It's not actually Babylon, it's Babylonian, but I've just abbreviated to make it because I'm running out of time. And verse 7, he physically changed them like a Babylon. You think, you look, you feel, you taste like a Babylonian. But, verse 8, Daniel, purpose in his heart. You can name me what you like, you can teach me what you like, you can put me where you like, but we're not going to eat the food that's presented to us. And they made their stand, young people, with just a small little insignificant thing of food. And making a stand in the small things was going to make it easier in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 4, when the big trials of life hit them. So they made the pact together. All four friends were involved. And you know, sometimes it is helpful to make a commitment when there's a group of you because each one can support and help and strengthen one another. Daniel and his three friends, how could they eat the king's meat? It was unclean under the law. It was not prepared according to the law. And it was offered to idols that was against God's law. Prove us with pulse, they said. And they made a stand. But you know what, young people? 
in that chapter there, there's one little verse that makes that stand even more tough. That verse there in verse 16. Let's read it together. You see, it's easy to say I'm going to eat pulse, but you know what? For those 10 days placed on the table right next to those bowl of peas was the best food that the king could offer. It was still there on their table for that 10 days. Thus, after 10 days, Melzer took away the portion of their meat and the wine and they continued eating pulse. You think of that, young people. You think of that as the trial there is for you. You've said, and you and your friends have said, we're not going to eat that meat, and they still keep putting it there just in front of you so the smell can waft into your nose. But these men purposed in their heart because they had a love for God, young people, and that's what is shown in their names. Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah, God has been gracious. Mishael, who's like Ale? Azariah, helped of Yah. These young boys had God's name stamped all over them, all through them. Prove us, they said. And in verse 15, at the end of 10 days, they stood before the king. You know, young people, sometimes we feel the pressure. We feel the struggle to make a stand. And we see others around us that, that, that tower above us in faith. They can move mountains, towering in faith that we, we, we feel we can never seem to attain. And like those other Jewish teenagers in verse 1, they gave in and they ate of the king's meat. You may struggle, young people, even in this situation. And you may have at times given in. But never give up. We may not all have the faith of these four friends, yet you know each one of us young people each one of us are a work in progress. And one of my favourite quotes is this quote found in Philippians 1 verse 6. Be confident of this, young person. Be confident of this, that God, who has begun a good work in you, he will complete his work until it's finally finished on the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. But these four teenagers in verse 19 says they stood before the king at the end of that verse. And it's all about, young people, it's all about in your life, it's all about the choices in making a stand. But before which king are you going to make that stand? These four teenagers made the stand early in life. And it's in those little trials of the testing of food where they built the strength, the commitment, the courage that when, when larger trials came, came into their, their life, they could inevitably face them. So, young people, as we finish off our talk tonight, there's one word that we must take out of our class this evening, and that is that word, purposed. For each one of us, we've got to make a decision, a choice, a challenge. We've got a purpose in our hearts to be like Daniel, to be like his three friends, and to make that stand. You know, young people, in life, the world is going to make a squeeze and a squeeze and a squeeze that is tighter and tighter and tighter. But Paul tells us this, don't let the Babylonian world around you squeeze you into its mould, but let God remould you, your minds from within. It's a purpose in our hearts, young people, remould your minds from within so that you might prove in practice that the plan of God, whether that is difficult at the moment, the plan of God ultimately is for your good. And he will meet all his demands as you move towards the maturity and the goal that is set before you. Young people, the choice, kingdom of men or the kingdom of God is that very choice that you purpose to make tonight. May God bless every one of you in that choice. Mm -hmm.